Ralph Rodriguez with Writer's Domain. We got Dave Moss in the studio. What is this? That would be the internals of a GSXR 1000 would be my guess from the color of the foot cap and the extremely faded red anodization on here from the sunshine. Uh, bonus points if you can <laughs> tell me what year model. These caps went from 05 to 08. Man, okay, so what happens to a fork while it's right, while you're riding it? Okay, so may I? Yes, sir. All right, so we'll use your shirt as a backdrop. This is bolted into the base of the fork so that this is held in place here. As you can see, this upper rod here is bolted to the cap. So you have your fork cartridge, you have your rebound rod. This tiny little silver donut here, if we were to disassemble this, is bottom out. Oh. So as you go through five, five inches of travel, that donut sinks into that hole. So if we rotate it this way, that donut will go straight into what we call the head of the cartridge. So from your observation, how much space is there between that rod and the head of the cartridge when you look down in the hole? Um, Quite a bit, right? Yeah. What happens know. when that little donut hits that space? How much space? It should slap it, yeah. Uh -huh. Wonder why a lot of people crash? Because they're bottoming out? When that hits that, what happens to the rate of collapse of the fork? It's... No display, no display, very little displacement. And then this goes down to a couple of thousandths of an inch clearance. Can the oil come out? Well, no, because the oil's got to come out the, the bottom, right? Right. So any oil that's in here and that donut hits it and that oil's trapped, right? Do you, oh. do you see a hole? No, no, no. So what happens when that donut hits that hole? Bam. Yeah. It, it, Hydraulic it, bottom out. So this is your safety warning buffer, except the safety warning buffer is a brick wall. So, so hydraulic or fork oil compresses. Yeah, so your movement so, of oil is basically, this is full of oil. This rod goes down, pushes the oil through your compression piston assembly, which is in here, right. and out that hole. So, but when it compresses, when you compress the fork oil, does it... Well, the fork oil it moves. back up? No. no. Okay. So, oil goes out this way, right? Right. Because you compress, everything comes down together. So the oil shoots back out into the fork. This rod has a piston inside it that pushes the oil down. Okay. And it comes out, so that's compression. So what they do to make sure that this rod doesn't smash into this piston assembly is put that donut on there. So that donut, it, when it hits the bottom here, leaves a clearance of a few millimeters here between the pistons. Got it. So you can't smash pieces together. That's its function. But in real terms, that donut's got to go all the way down that cap. So it hits a brick wall. So what we do for track bikes, right. because generally track bikes will use more travel, and race bikes that have these, what we call revalved, which is new pistons and valving, because at the track you're going a lot faster. We drill a one millimeter hole at the bottom here. So when that donut hits there, what happens to that oil? It's well, it, captive. It'll <coughs> come out the side. So you don't crash anymore. Hydraulic lock is so severe on these types of cartridges that when you drill this hole, you go P -p -p and you feel where you're at. One of the problems is we're taught to do with our hands, not feel. So when we go in and amend these and improve them for track riding, that's one of the key things we do here. You always leave something like this, donut or whatever's in there for bottom out, so you don't smash your pistons together and destroy your forks. So that's a fixed, that's a fixed thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. So the other thing that happens is, and we'll hold this up, this is wide here and it is narrow here. Remember that shock spring we talked about earlier? Yeah. Are the wines different in the gaps? Uh, they're, these are, would not be a progressive? No, they're progressive because they're conical. See the shape? Tapers thin here. Oh, okay. It's fat there. Oh, okay. Oh, yes. So, when it's soft, it'll do the same thing as a shock spring. What was a shock spring shape? Different both ends, right? Right. So it's conical. So in that case, it's progressive. So for a street bike, you want as much comfort as possible through as much range as you're given. 
So putting a progressive spring on the front and the back of the bike makes the bike handle the road better generally. This is your preload spacer and right inside of it there's still some more white which I'm going to turn it that way so you can see the white. <clears throat> a lot of times in a lot of manufacturing that internal casting that's all piece, part of this is to keep the spring still. Holds the spring in place, that's its function. And sometimes that casting's a little longer because the spring isn't crunched into place properly. So when you take the spring off, it should be 10 to 12 millimeters longer on the bench than it is here. Which is why that space is in there to make sure the spring is set to its correct height. And then up here is preload. So if it's too soft, you can add more. When you add more, that silver ring here, correct, and those two tabs, if we were to add preload to that now, that gap between the cap and the tab would increase. What would that do to the spring? It pushes it down. Shorten it. Yeah. Now, given that's the case, we can add and remove preload, which is awesome. We can make it stiffer or softer because it's progressive. The other part, though, is, is that spring perfectly centered against that donut? No. So every time this goes up and down, the spring buckles and moves. The tolerance between the fork and the spring is extremely thin. So as the spring buckles and moves, compression and release, what does it scrape? Uh, it's scraping the, the metal, the metal right. on metal. So a, a set of forks with 25,000 miles on, <laughs> with 350 cc's of oil, before, uh, had 150 cc's of metal in it. Yeah, yeah, and it's amazing. And you've got the bottle somewhere. I mm -hmm. think you keep it in your trailer, but there's a good, yeah. a good amount of metal on the bottom of this uh, because pile of oil. Because it's not secured on the bottom. It can move. There's nothing holding it in place, right? So as you ride up and down, how many, even down the street, how many times do the forks compress and release? So every time that happens, it scrapes a tiny bit of metal on the inside. And unfortunately, guess what those holes do? Suck it up. Yeah. So you can devastate the handling of your motorcycle if you don't change your fork oil every 6,000 miles. The longer you go, the more metal contamination you get. If the holes in the pistons here are small, it's not a car engine piston, which is solid to contain an explosion. We need flow through the pistons. Then you block those holes. Now nothing works anymore. And it's been so bad in certain instances, we've thrown them away and put different pistons in because you can't drill them out. I'm always scared when you ask me a question because it's a 50-50 chance that I'm going to well, get it right or wrong. <laughs> but the 50-50 chance is exactly what the people watching this are going to go with too. Right. And the fact that you're willing to, well, it's, maybe it's this, rather than pff, whatever, means you want to learn. And that's awesome because understanding what we've got means... Oh, I see how that works. Now I get why you change the oil frequently. Well, for me, um, I love talking to you, and, I, and I've known you so long, and I've asked you so many dumb questions, and I think that there's a fear of people asking questions, especially in social media nowadays. You ask a dumb question, you're going to get bombarded with, with, uh, with people who are going to tell you you're dumb, you're stupid. And, and I love that you you explain everything because your your goal is to help people and my goal is to, to get people to listen to you and to, to watch you. Which I appreciate very much because that's the more people we can help, which means that's more lives saved. So you want to get me that other fork? Yeah. So we can go through something quickly in regards to that. All right, so this is a GSX-R600 fork. We've got our preload adjuster on the top. We have our rebound adjuster on the top as well. Uh, bonus points for uh, year, year model. 05. Ah, uh, 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 03. Damn. Oh, well. Right, you're 50 That's 06, they went to upside down fork, so that was a guess. Uh. But one of the things about a telescopic fork versus an upside down fork that we had on the Aprilia is that we need to know where bottom out is, right? Right. So in this case, if we were to put a cable tie on there, and then there's bottom. That's your bottom. That's bottom. So at this point, if you're trying to work fork geometry, right, and get the bike to turn like you want it to, right, you need to know where that is. Because what's here, your lower triple clamp. And if you go too far, 
this hammers into your triple clamp and you crash. So no matter whether you have telescopic forks or whether you have upside down forks where this piece is at the bottom, you need to know how much travel you've got and there's a video on where is fork bottom out. Probably 80% of all crashes are bottom out crashes because nobody takes the time to mark it. And because people don't measure sag, they don't know how much travel they've got. Every bike I did last night, with the exception of one, was touching bottom out and they didn't know. Wow. So knowing this and watching that video, where is fork bottom out, that will save a life all by itself because you administer travel. So if that's our gap, right? I a lot of times get people say, oh, this thing's beating me to death, it's way too <laughs> soft. And they're using that much travel. They don't see using a cable tie, an O-ring or a zip tie, how much travel they're using before they make that statement. Well, that's beating you to death because it's too stiff. That's beating you to death because it's, it's too, too soft. soft. And it's that simple. Will you put a cable tie or a zip tie on your bike and go ride it and see what you've got? Now, SAG is a number in a book. Out there is street smart. What works for you? So you can look at a book, you can put it in the ballpark, but then it's your bike. It's your roads, it's your riding, it's your pace. This has to work for you. Ideally, you want to get to 75% of travel on the road because there are gateways and cars and tourists and all kinds of other stuff that need you to react. So you need a buffer. Right, for hard braking, for maneuvers in a corner, maneuvers. you've got to correct your line where you go and say 60 through a corner and it's banked and your suspension's already compressed. And then there's other things like pieces of toast that I fell off on where you can't avoid anything because somebody lobbed a piece of toast out in the middle of the road and that put <laughs> me on the ground. So for travel, knowing what you have is absolutely critical and unfortunately, nobody gives a damn until I show up and teach them that. So hopefully, everybody's willing to go spend five bucks, get a bag of cable ties from any hardware store, and share them. Put them on your bikes after you measure bottom out, follow the video and go for a ride and see what you're doing and begin to dial in your bike because it was never built for you. Thanks, Dave. You're welcome. That was a lot of useful information about <laughs> forks, man. I, I, I had no idea, you know, just exactly how, you know, the internals worked, especially that bit about the, the spring scraping on the metal and, and, and creating such havoc inside. Right. There's, uh, there's a lot of moving parts in those forks that mm -hmm. people don't take uh, into consideration. Yeah. And all that scraping is going to leave little metal shavings on the bottom of your oil. Gosh. <laughs> one more thing to worry about, right? Right, one more thing. Yeah. That's why it's so important to change your fork oil. You guys changing your fork oil often? I, I know I'm going to start doing it uh, a lot more often. You know, it, it sounds like it's so integral to the performance of your bike. It's very important because it's going to help. Uh, your, it's going to help your fork seals. They're mm -hmm. going to stay cleaner. Um, they might last a little bit longer. Um, you know, there's metal shavings on the bottom from those uh, springs moving up and down. Mm -hmm. um, there's just so, it's just so much better for your bike. Again, we ride on two wheels. We got to make sure this thing is in top condition, especially for people who like to, you know, have spirited rides. Absolutely. You guys, leave us a comment. Tell us about, you know, your plans to change fork oil. Uh, I know I'm, like I said, I'm going to be doing it as soon as possible. Dave, Seems like a really great guy. I mean, he, he knows his stuff, and it seems like it's all based in a, in a pretty grounded philosophy. I, you know, I'm, I'm excited to hear a little bit more about that, too. Yeah, he really has the ability to, to explain things in an easy-to-understand way. And what I love about him is that sometimes I'll look at him with that deer-in-the-headlight look and, yeah. and ask him to explain it again, and he'll, he'll explain it. Uh, I, there's not a time where I'm with Dave that I don't learn something new. He's... He's got just, again, 25 years of knowledge in, in motorcycles, motorcycle racing. And uh, I really appreciate talking to him every time because, again, I learn something yeah. every time. I bet. I bet. Well, if you guys want to learn more about Dave, Dave Moss Tuning, be sure to stay tuned for the next installment.